All right, ladies and gentlemen, once again, and very briefly, let me direct all of you to the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. We were in this particular place when our time was concluded last time. And I'd like to go back there just once again because we were elaborating on the time of the rise of the apostate church or the falling away. Now, hold your finger in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you will, and flip back in the first letter. I'm talking about chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, and we'll begin reading in verse 13. Now, notice from verse 13 down through verse 18, the Apostle Paul gives a quite detailed discussion of the second coming of Christ and the resurrection. But we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that fall asleep, that you sorrow not. But they misunderstood this. When Paul penned this epistle, they thought that the second coming of Christ was right at hand. And to correct that misunderstanding, Paul writes this second epistle, chapter 2. Now, with that in mind, you can understand what he's saying. Now, we... Beseech you, brethren, touching the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together unto him to the end, that you be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet be troubled, either by spirit, or by word, or by epistle, as from us, as that the day of the Lord is just at hand. I don't want to get the idea that Christ's coming is right around the corner. And then he says that something must happen before it comes. Let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be it. That is, the second of Christ, coming to Christ, except the falling away come first. That's the general apostasy that he spoke of in Acts chapter 20, 28, and 29 to those elders when he said that I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter not sparing the flock, and men shall arise from among yourselves to lead the disciples away after them. Remember you not that while I was with you, I told you these things. All right, the man of sin must be revealed. The son of perdition, he that opposeth and exalteth himself against all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he setteth in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me say that this man of sin and this son of perdition right here refers to the very same thing that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7 that he referred to as the little horn. This is the same thing that made war against God's saints. All right, now, remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. This is not something new. Paul preached this every place that he went. But I want you to notice now that this apostasy was not to arise from outside the church. This man of sin was not to be an outsider, but he was to arise within the church. Notice that. See that? He setteth himself forth as God in the temple of God. That's the church of God. That's a corruption within the church. All right, now, verse 6. And now ye know that which restraineth. I pointed out to you last time that this was none other than the Roman Empire. All right, as long as the Roman Empire had full authority in the world, then, of course, Catholicism could not arise to the end that he may be revealed in his own season. That's talking about the popes, that false religion. For the mystery of lawliness doth already work. In other words, a little leaven is now working. Only there is one that restraineth now. That's talking about the Roman Empire, the Caesar's own throne, until he be taken out of the way, that is the Roman Empire, and then, now mark that word then, and then, all right, now, when were they taken out of the way? 476 A.D., Paul says, and then look for the rise of this man of sin. See that? And then shall be revealed the lawless one whom the Lord shall slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to naught by the manifestation of his coming. But I want you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, that there's hundreds and thousands of years involved in verse 8. From the rise of this man of sin until his uh, 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 ultimate and final destruction by Jesus himself. We know we'll cover more than a thousand, two thousand years. Because he wants to reign 
and persecute the church for 1260 years. We've already found that in Revelation 12. Uh, 12. All right, now, in verse 9, even he whose coming is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceit of unrighteousness for them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, I'll not do it again because we've already done it. But in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, we have a detailed account of the struggle of this Bible during the reign of the Catholic Church, 1260 years, this Bible, known as God's two witnesses, I'm talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament, the olive trees, the oil in them, these candlesticks permeated by the Holy Spirit, prophesied in sackcloth and ashes for that period, 1260 years. At the end of that time, ladies and gentlemen, they were killed. I read to you in the history of the French Revolution many, many times. We've talked about it. How that the French Convention stamped the Bible, tried to, tried to completely eliminate it. Uh, they made a new calendar in which they eliminated the seven form and came up with a ten-day calendar. They tried to eliminate any name of anything that related to God. They wanted to exterminate His name from the earth. They wanted to eliminate it. And they wanted all calendars, all events, to start their date not from Jesus, but from the beginning of the French Revolution. Now these laws and this tomfoolery and this wild conduct of the jungle continued for three and a half day years. That's the three and a half days of Revelation 11, at the end of which, then of course these witnesses stood up on their feet and they began to preach. Now, I've got a little church history book and I'll be referring and giving you the titles of these books, and all of you who are interested need to get them. You need to build your library, brethren, if, you're, brethren, if you really want to be sound in the faith and understand what's going on. But in a way, right here in our country, somewhere around the turn of the century, I'm talking about the 19th century, around 1796, 1800, 1805, somewhere right along there, simultaneously unaware of one another, there were men that were breaking away from denominational churches. They'd begin to reach the Bible. They were all reaching the same conclusion, and that is that Catholicism was wrong, denominationalism was sinful, creeds were a violation of God's law, and these men began to break away. Now, James O'Kelly broke away from the Methodist church. Write his name down, if you will. James O'Kelly, Methodist. Number two, Abner Jones. Baptist Church, came out of the Baptist Church. Number three, Martin W. Stone broke away from the Presbyterian Church. And we'll list many more. But now, let me say, ladies and gentlemen, that the movement got its great impetus or its greatest power from the leadership of two men, one of them by the name of Thomas Campbell and the other Alexander Campbell, father and son. Both of them had been members of the Presbyterian Church. But they began to read their Bible, and again, they themselves in isolation. The father in this country, his son over in Scotland, had come to the same conclusion that denominationalism was a sin, and therefore they were willing to lay aside all creeds and go back directly to the Bible. Now, in the year 1809, Mark this down, if you will, and I'm going slow for the benefit of you young men that are listening to me that has, have never heard of this, and you young ladies that are not familiar with our history. In the year 1809, there was a little document published written by Thomas Campbell called the Declaration and Address. Now take your pencil and write that down, if you will, please. Declaration and Address. It was not designed to be a constitution of any church not a constitution or a creed of any kind. It was simply a little document. I think it covered some 50, 52 pages that outlined their belief about what Thomas Campbell believed about denominationalism in the church. Now, let me read with you just a minute, if you will. And I said in the very outset that this, this lessons and this material is not designed for amateurs are beginners necessarily that are not interested in truth. Now, I'm not saying that 
if you're a new convert that you shouldn't listen to this. I'm simply saying for people that are not interested in God's truth. Because we're given some stuff now that will take time to digest and a little time for all of us to understand. Now, this declaration and address begins like this. From the series of events which have taken place in the churches for many years past, especially in the Western country as well as from what we know in general to the present state of things in the Christian world, we are persuaded that it's high time for us not only to think but also to act for ourselves, to see with our own eyes and to take all of our measures directly and immediately from the divine standard to this alone we feel ourselves divinely bound to be conformed and by this alone we must be judged. Now listen to him well. In other words, he is elevating the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. We are also persuaded that no man can be judged for his brother. So no man can judge for his brother. Every man must be allowed to judge for himself. As every man must marry his own judgment, must give account of himself to God. We are of the opinion that as the divine word is equally binding upon all, so all lie under an equal obligation to be bound by it and it alone and not by any human interpretation of it and that therefore no man has a right to judge his brother except in so far as he manifestly violates the express letter of the law. That every such judgment is an express violation of the law of God, a daring usurpation of his throne and a gross intrusion upon the rights and liberties of his subjects, we are therefore of the opinion that we should beware of such things, that we should keep at the utmost distance from everything of this nature, and that knowing the judgment of God against them that commit such things, we should neither do the same ourselves nor take pleasure in them that do them. Moreover, being well aware from sad experience of the heinous nature and pernicious tendency of religious controversy among Christians, Tired and sick of the bitter jerry, jarring and jangling of party spirit, we would desire to be at rest and where possible we would also desire to adopt and recommend such measures as would give rest to our brethren throughout all the churches, as would restore unity, peace and purity to the whole church of God. Now you must understand, ladies and gentlemen, that these men were in denominationalism at the time and they were sick of party spirits. Understand, if you will, under they were sick of creeds. Know what he was talking about. All right, this desirable rest, however, we utterly despair either to find for ourselves or to be able to recommend to our brethren by continuing amid the diversity and rancor of party contentions, the varying uncertainty and clashing of human opinions, and indeed can we reasonably expect to find it anywhere but in Christ and his simple word, which is the same yesterday, today and forever. Our desire, therefore, for ourselves and our brethren would be that rejecting human opinions and the inventions of men of, as any, of any authority or as having any place in the church of God, we might forever cease from further contentions about such things, returning to and holding fast by the original standard, taking the divine word alone for our rule, the Holy Spirit for our teacher and guide, to lead us into all truth and Christ alone as exhibited in the word for our salvation, that by so doing we may be at peace among ourselves, following peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Impressed in these sentiments, we have resolved as follows. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is what we call the introduction to this little piece that we call the Declaration and Address. Now, I want you to notice once again, if you will, that he made the statement that they were sick of the wrangling and the jabbering and the jarring that was going on in the churches, that it was high time for Christian people to have peace. And he said that the only kind of peace was that peace which was founded upon God's law. Now, my friends, that's exactly what we're pleading for today. And this is the thing that we need. We don't believe that every man can do his thing and every man can express his own opinion if it violates God's law. 
We don't believe that the God of heaven has given us the right to do anything that we want to do. We believe exactly like these men that the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a thing that must be done. Now, let me continue to give you just a little bit more information, if I will, here. Now, the restoration was fully, fully launched. When Thomas Campbell was working out the principles of the Declaration and Address, his son Alexander Campbell was still in Glasgow, Scotland, was becoming dissatisfied with the Sea Cedar Church. The Campbell family had started for America in, sep in September of 1808, but had been shipwrecked off the coast of Scotland and decided to spend a year there so Alexander could study in the university in which his father had been educated. Now, you can see then, I I I've read that and I've said this to show you, that this was not something that these men came up with conjointly. In other words, their ideas ripened, ladies and gentlemen, independently one of the other. Now, the first church, the first of Christian association was not planned to be a church in any sense. Thomas Campbell held to the position that for some time, but being convinced that the denominations were not going to unite or give fellowship to any would not accept their creeds, he became willing to organize the group as a worshiping congregation. And therefore, on October 1810, a congregation applying for admission into the Pittsburgh Senate of the Presbyterian Church was refused. In 1811, the Brush Run Church was organized as an independent congregation. Thomas Campbell was appointed elder and Alexander licensed to preach. The following day, the church met for worship and celebrated the Lord's Supper for the first time. Determined to follow the scriptures, the congregation decided that weekly communion was to be observed since there was an approved precedent for it. All right, now, one member of the new church, Joseph Bryant, refused to partake of the Lord's Supper because he had not been immersed. He also insisted that his baptism follow the New Testament pattern of immersion. In harmony with his desire, Thomas Campbell immersed him. This is the first example of immersion in the work of the camels. Here it is. Now, on March the 12th, 1811, Thomas Campbell married Mrs. Martha Brown, daughter of John Brown of Brook County, West Virginia. She and her parents were members of the Presbyterian Church, and when the first baby Jane was born a year later, the question of infant baptism came up. Alexander read all he could find on the subject, both in English and French, and was amazed at the weakness of the arguments that had been offered in its defense. Consulting the original language of the New Testament, Greek, he became convinced that immersion alone constituted scriptural baptism and that it was valid only for a believer. He discussed his findings with his wife, who shared his conclusion, and it was decided that infants would not be baptized. The fact that he rejected infant baptism forced him to conclude that those who had received it were still unbaptized, and that included himself. They had simply experienced a ceremony in their infancy. He further concluded that he could not continue his own ministry and immerse others, not having been immersed himself as a believer. Now watch these men, ladies and gentlemen, as they're growing, as they're understanding, as they're thinking about the scriptures. Having reached this conclusion, Alexander made a trip of 30 miles to see whether Matthias Luce, a Baptist preacher, would agree to baptize him. On the way, he stopped by to tell his father of his convictions and found that his sister Dothea had reached the very same conclusion that he had. Thomas, his father, offered no objection to his proposal. In conference with Mr. Luce, Alexander made it clear that the ceremony would have to be performed precisely in accordance with New Testament pattern. There would be no recitation of a religious experience. The candidates were to be immersed upon the simple confession that Jesus is the Son of God. Although though this was contrary to Baptist custom, Luce agreed to run the risk of censure and perform the rite June the 12th, 1812, 
in Buffalo Creek. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from the standpoint of the Camels, this is the way the restoration movement started. Now, as these lessons progress, I want to list a number of good books for you young men and you people that are interested to secure and to put in your library. I'm a firm believer that no church can ever be any stronger than the knowledge of the people who compose it. Now, first of all, allow me to say, ladies and gentlemen, that here is the only rule of faith and practice. This is the very thing that we look to. These men were not inspired. These men were doing the very best they could to restore primitive Christianity because they had the ability, the honesty, and they had the fortitude and the courage to look around and see that what was going on in their midst was not in harmony with God's law and therefore they were willing to make a change. Now until we get people with the same kind of integrity and veracity today, Men with the wisdom and the understanding of God's law that will look around in the congregations in which they worship and see that they're not doing if they're not. And ladies and gentlemen, allow me to emphasize that we are not. Then, my friends, there's no way that we can ever rejuvenate, renew, or restore primitive Christianity in our lifetime. Now, I'm not saying that we've come up with any new ideas. As a matter of fact, I'm giving credit where credit due. I've showed you what the Bible says. I've showed you that the pioneers are doing the very same thing that I'm advocating. But I'm simply holding up and submitting for your consideration that the churches of Christ, as we know them today, have lapsed and slipped right back into the very same mold. I'm talking about denominationalism from which these men came. And they did it, ladies and gentlemen, for the same reason that denominationalism was started in the very outset, simply because people were willing to place something alongside the Bible or on top of it, and that was human creeds and human traditions. We don't care what the pioneers said. We're not interested in what they thought, unless what they said and what they thought is in harmony with God's law. And ladies and gentlemen, as we go down through here and familiarize ourselves with these men, and I want to start now from about 1800, and we want to study in detail some of the movements and the happenings of the Restoration Movement for 50 years, you'll find out that a great many of these men, such as James O. Kelly himself, made the start, faltered, and fell by the wayside. And many of these men did the very same thing. But the thing that I'm pleading for is the thing that they understood in the very outset. Number one, that something needed to be done. And the thing that needed to be done was a restoration to this book. Now this is what I'm saying. Do we have the equipment, ladies and gentlemen, do we have the essential equipment to restore New Testament Christianity upon this earth? Well, let's see if we do in the few minutes that I've got remaining. First of all, take your Bibles. All of you take your Bibles with me and turn back into the book of Genesis. The very first chapter of the book of Genesis. If I remember right, verse 11. Let's read verse 11 and see what it says. And I want all of you to take your pencil and mark it. And God said, let the earth put forth grass, herbs yielding seed, and fruit tree bearing fruit after their kind, Wherein is the seed thereof upon the earth, and it was so. Now, to summarize, to, to summarize this passage, what Moses is saying is that seed bears after its kind. In other words, if you plant cotton seed, you'll get cotton. If you plant a watermelon seed, you'll not get cantaloupe. Seed bears after its kind. This is a universal law of God, a universal law of nature that seed bears after its kind. You understand? Now, ladies and gentlemen, turn with me, if you will, into the fourth chapter of the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. In the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, we have a parable uttered and spoken by Jesus. We've got a similar account of it in the eighth chapter of the book of Luke. And while we're turning there, all of you turn your Bibles to the eighth chapter of Luke as well as the fourth chapter of the book of Mark. 
But let's begin reading in the fourth chapter of the book of Mark. Now notice what he said. Verse 21. And he said unto them, Is the lamp brought to be put under a bushel, or under the bed, and not to be put on the stand? For there is nothing hid, save that it should be manifested, neither was anything made secret, but that it should come to light. If any man hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I say. Let us take heed what I hear, what we hear. Now then, let's go back into verse 3 of chapter 4. And he taught them, verse 2, many things in parables, and said unto them, Behold, the sower went forth to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured it, and others fell on the rocky ground, where it had not much earth, and straightway it sprang up, because it had no depthness of earth. And when the sun was risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and choked it, and yielded no fruit. And others fell into the good ground, and yielded fruit, drawn up, and increasing, and brought forth thirty, some sixty, some a hundredfold. And he said, Who hath ears? Let him hear. Now from this parable, ladies and gentlemen, we find out that in our preaching, that apparently three out of four will not heed the call. You understand that? We don't have the right kind of soil. Now turn with me to the 8th chapter, and let's see what Luke had to say. The 8th chapter of the book of Luke. And when a great multitude came together, they of every city resorted unto him. He spake a parable. The sower went forth to sow, sow the seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside was trodden underfoot, the birds of the heaven devoured it. And others fell on the rock, and as soon as it grew, it withered away. And because it had no moisture, others fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And others fell into the good ground, and grew, and brought forth a hundredfold. And he said unto them, listen to me, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in verse 15, and that in the good ground, these are such as is an honest and good heart, having heard the word, hold it fast, and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, let's sum up what's necessary in the restoration of primitive Christianity. First of all, we've got to understand this universal law of seed bearing, that seed produces after its kind. We've got to understand, number two, that this word of God is the seed of the kingdom. We've got to understand that the honest and good heart is the soil. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if I plant the same seed now that they planted back yonder, and if this seed that I plant falls into the honest and good heart, it will produce the very same thing today that it produced 2,000 years ago. Someone said, Brother Rudd, that's right. I'll agree with you 100%. Now, the only thing left then for us to do is to ascertain what it produced in apostolic times. Those people became Christians. That's all. Three times that word is used in the Bible. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Acts 11, 26. Agrippa said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Acts 26, 28. And Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 16, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Paul said in Romans 16, 16, The churches of Christ salute you. My friends, this Bible will make only Christians. It will not make anything but that. And when these people congregate themselves together to keep house and worship to God, they will constitute churches of Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. And my friends, this is the basis of uh, restoration, and this is the platform on which these platform uh, these pioneers built. And this is the thing that I'm pleading. We'll pick this up next time. Our time is gone. I hope you've enjoyed.